Hey, welcome back to Learning Self Reliance. Today I want to do a Faraday cage misconceptions video. Uh, I think there's a lot of confusion about how a Faraday cage works and some things that people think you need to do with a Faraday cage that you don't. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of those today. Uh, I'm going to be referencing a lot with this book here, which I highly recommend this book, this EMP Attacks and Solar Storms by Dr. Arthur T. Bradley. All right, first misconception is that you can test your Faraday cage using a cell phone or a radio. So this is my cell phone here. Yes, I still use a flip phone. Uh, I'm going to open up this Faraday cage that I've got here and stick this cell phone in here and I'm going to make a call to it and it's going to work. Okay, and that's fine and I'll explain that in a second. So let me open this up and put this in there. Right in like that. Let me turn up the volume to make sure you guys can hear it. Make sure the bail is locked, okay? Okay, I'm using my wife's phone to call it. Okay, there we go. There we go, my wife is calling me on here. Now, why did this work? Why did this work? One thing I like to think of with a Faraday cage is that this isn't a, a wall that blocks all of the radio frequencies. What this is is more like earplugs, okay? So when you go and you shoot your firearm, you put earplugs in your ears, and you can still hear, you can still hear guns going off, but it doesn't damage your ears anymore. That's what this Faraday cage is gonna do. This cell phone is made to use tiny amounts of power amounts of wattage and still be able to make a phone call. It can receive a small amount of power, still make a phone call, send and receive, okay? Same thing with like a ham radio or a walkie-talkie or something like that. If you put a walkie-talkie in here, you're still going to be able to hear the transmission coming out of this Faraday cage. That's because this isn't blocking all frequencies, it's just toning it down so that it doesn't damage the electronics. In the same way that earplugs lower the decibels that you hear and so that your ears don't get damaged this metal skin here this metal cage here is going to lower the decibels of the radio frequency and it's going to prevent your electronics from getting damaged okay that's misconception number one i think a lot of people really misunderstand that there's a lot of youtube videos of people putting a radio or their cell phone in there and then they, they it doesn't quite work and they're like what I, th I think it's working a lot of this stuff is covered in this book highly recommend it Misconception number two, let's go right into the book here. Right here is a diagram of how a Faraday cage really works, okay? A lot of people think that you have to have your Faraday cage grounded, which is not true, okay? You can see here that this Faraday cage, this little square here, is not grounded. This isn't going to be redirecting power into the ground. What it's going to do, as demonstrated in this diagram, is the radio waves are going to hit this and it induce a magnetic field in here. So radio is gonna hit this thing, it's gonna create electricity inside of this, inside of this metal. When it does that, it's gonna create an opposite electromagnetic field inside of it, okay? So the metal receives radio, creates an opposite field because of that charge, and inside of here, it becomes a net zero electromagnetic field, okay? So let me give you a little shot of this diagram here. You can see the electromagnetic field gets induced and it's going this direction and inside, because the electromagnetic field induced in here, inside the metal, it creates an opposite field, see that it's pointing the opposite direction, creates a net zero. You don't need to have your Faraday cage grounded because the metal is gonna create a magnetic field which is the opposite of the magnetic field that you're receiving. Okay, started around quite a bit through that, but hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Next misconception is that an EMP or a coronal mass ejection is going to take out all electronics. Okay, that's not quite true. Let me show you a little diagram from this book here. The different weapon creates a different frequency of the EMP. And different frequencies are going to affect different electronic devices. Okay, so like a cell phone is going to be affected mostly by high frequency EMPs, okay? If we have a coronal mass ejection from the sun, we're going to have something like a low frequency 
EMP, and that's not likely to affect this electronic, but it is likely to affect something like the grid and power lines, so I won't be able to charge this. So the end result is that most people are going to not have power, but this electronic might still work. So something like a flashlight or something that's vital, if you've got some solar power or something like that, you'll probably be able to charge it. But again, it's highly dependent on what happened. If it's a nuclear missile that was designed to take out, you know, everything, a nice wide swath, take out the grid, take out cell phones, take out cars, things like that, that could really take a huge toll. But something like a natural coronal mass ejection is going to be a little bit different. All right, next misconception, and this is going to ruffle, I think, quite a lot of feathers. Uh, some people have a really romanticized view of EMPs, but according to this book here, not every car in the world is going to suddenly stop working. A lot of, uh, I've read quite a few EMP books, and in the books, you know, if your car is older than like 1980 or something like that, you're, you're good. You know, the thing's fine. After that, completely ruined, it's a giant paperweight, right? Not according to this book. According to this book, about 15% of the nation's 90 million trucks, we're talking about semi-trucks, would experience an engine stall, some with permanent damage. Approximately 70% of trucks would experience other anomalies, okay? This isn't saying that every single truck is gonna break and then be done. And this is other anomalies, some with permanent damage, okay? You can check the sources on this for yourself, but a lot of the trucking and stuff is still gonna work, temporarily, right? If they can't get gas or something because there's no grid to provide the truck with gas, obviously the truck's not going to work. But the truck itself might be fine. So if you can store up some fuel, even if you've got a modern vehicle, it very well may be that your car is going to keep running, even with all those microchips that everybody claims is going to die. That's according to this book. I found this to be really informative here. Nice quick tip here is testing suggests that an EMP would cause approximately 70% of cars and trucks to experience an anomaly with 10 to 15 percent immediately stalling but again that's not permanent damage okay a lot of vehicles are probably still going to work sorry to ruin that bit, a bit of a romanticized thing i know a lot of people love the idea that we're all going to have to suddenly be amish but i don't think that's quite going to be true all right guys that's it for the misconceptions let's move on to some faraday cage talk here so i've got this barons or berens or however the heck you pronounce this six gallon steel can here. I've reinforced it a little bit on the lid here. Let me pull this lid off and show you. A little bit of this aluminum tape here around uh, some of the seams just to make sure that this thing is good and sealed. Now this is my small Faraday cage and this one I use to keep my bug out bag equipment in such as flashlights and radios and things like that, a solar panel and a battery. I pull those out and move them into my bag when I do a mock bug out, but I keep them inside of this Faraday cage because they're so valuable. Uh, I don't want to keep them in a sealed one. I have another one that I have sealed with, with you know, this same aluminum tape around the rim here, but then it makes it really difficult to open and expensive to open and close and open and close as I use this thing very often. So this is just a small Faraday cage just for a couple of bags worth of items, okay? Let me show you what we got going inside here. So I'll pull the lid off. And first thing you see is cardboard. This thing has got tons of cardboard all the way around the edges of this here, on the bottom and on the top. That way the electronics cannot physically touch this metal here. Because remember, this is going to have an electromagnetic field running through it. This is going to be electrified, right? Which is going to wear off after the EMP is done. I got this Faraday cage on the recommendation of this book. This guy tested a whole bunch of different uh, Faraday cage styles here. So he's got a, a large can. This is the same can that I've got, a larger uh, can. I've got the same one, ammo can. Uh, another one with some perforations in it, a uh, microwave oven, and like kind of a gun safe. I think this is probably one of the most valuable diagrams in this book, this little chart here. This shows the effective field negation of the specific Faraday cage that he tested, okay? So right here, this is my uh, garbage can, right? This is the one I've got here. You can see, depending on the frequency that he used to test this, my Faraday cage here would probably reduce over 50 decibels of the 100 kilohertz range, okay? And that changes depending on the different frequency. My taped garbage can downstairs, I do have things in a, in a, a sort of static bag down there, so I expect to get something more like this. But this one doesn't have that static or the extra taping, so I'm just going to consider it like this. This, I think, is so valuable coming out of this book because this lets you know 
really per frequency, you know, depending on the event, a nuclear bomb or a, a coronal, coronal mass ejection or something like that, how effective an item is going to be. Okay, so I mean, we've got this fire safe here and it helps. Look at that, right? That, that's some decent reduction, but it's not quite as much as something like just this can here. So I got this can, I think for like 15 bucks, something like that. Uh, it does have this nice locking bail. You can see right over here, it's got this kind of loop that comes out and it really holds the lid down nice and tight. He talks about this one specifically in his book uh, because he talks about how people were complaining that this bail was too hard to open and it held it down so tight they couldn't open it. And he's like, that's exactly what you want, you know. All right, guys, that's it with this Faraday cage here in this misconceptions video. Uh, this is a very simple Faraday cage. I think anybody can do. I mean, you just buy this guy. You can buy it at your local hardware store like Home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, make sure you get the one with a lid and preferably uh, with this locking bail like this here. Really holds it down nice and tight. Make sure you got it on right. You can pick up some aluminum tape if you want. This is for duct work. So you can go to the duct aisle and purchase that aluminum tape if you want, but I don't think that's quite necessary. I threw that on there because I already had it for the larger Faraday cage. Then you just cut out some cardboard uh, and a circle or two circles and just you know bend it around for the in, for the edges here and that's it. And then you can put some items in there. You can uh, put it in a static bag like he recommends in this book. But as you saw in the diagram, that doesn't make a huge difference, but it does make some difference. All right, I wanna throw this on here at the end. Uh, I don't think that a Faraday cage is for everybody. Uh, if you're new to uh, emergency preparedness and things like that, just skip it. I, I don't think, I think this is over the top uh, and unnecessary for most stuff, but I did it because I can and it wasn't that much money to me to just buy this uh, can and throw some cardboard in it and some electronics that I already had anyways. So if you're new to emergency preparedness, stuff like that, get your food, get your water and stuff set back, and then maybe later think about doing something like this. Uh, I, I decided to make this video because a lot of people were talking about the whole Russia uh, nuke thing. I've seen quite a lot of fear mongering on YouTube by some pretty big names, you know, saying, this is it, guys, this is it. You know, get ready, buy this stuff. You know, some people, you know, go to my site, buy this stuff. You know, we'll take care of you right there. They're trying to make a profit off of some people, and I think that's pretty ridiculous. But, uh, you know, this Russia thing could end a nuclear war, but everybody thought the Cold War was going to do that, and it never ended up doing it. Who knows? I'm just saying, who knows what's going to happen in the future? Uh, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't cash out that 401k, you know, just because uh, things look bad. Things have looked bad for a long time. You know, last year it was Jade Helm and that was it. Obama's going to take us all out. You know, Hitler 14.0, right? I mean, a lot of fear mongering and stuff going on. Stay calm. Do your preparedness. If you don't have a Faraday cage and you've got your, your other ducks in a row, maybe think about throwing one of these together. I hope this answers some questions for people who have never uh, got, you know, they get a little confused about a Faraday cage and think it's some complicated thing, but it's not that complicated and it's pretty easy to make yourself. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.